My name is Joe Gorelick, and I'm the president of the Dermatology Education Foundation. And this is our weekly DEF video series webinar. Tonight, we're going to have a discussion on what we've learned about skin reactions and the manifestations associated with COVID-19 exposure. This will be presented by Dr. Brad Glick. And then we'll visit with physician assistant TJ Chow from Georgia, who, whose practice is gonna reopen this week. So tonight we're gonna to share the results of our recent uh, Dermatology PA and NP survey. If you have not had a chance to do that, uh, please take a few moments to complete the survey if you haven't done so. Uh, it's been really interesting. We'll go over some of those results. So I wanna just set the table in terms of um, the information that's gonna be provided tonight for everyone. So all of the advice and information and guidance that we're gonna provide this evening is based on the most up-to-date data and information available. Uh, as you know, these things are changing and more information is coming in on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, not even day-to-day -day basis anymore. So as we learn more every day, it really is our goal to provide you with this information and serve as a resource for our dermatology community. The current regulatory situation in the United States remains extremely fluid. So please follow the guidance provided to you by your practice, your practice administrators, your supervising physicians, your collaborative agreements, and or your state licensing boards. And we urge you to please follow the most up-to-date mandates and direction provided to you by your state and local government. So our dermatology MPA, NP and PA community continues to benefit from collectively shared information and experiences. So uh, now more than ever, PAs and MPs need to share our resources so we can all evolve and thrive as we navigate through this crisis and the unique challenges that it presents to us and our specialty. So the poll that I mentioned earlier was conducted uh, sent out by the DEF, the Dermatology Education Foundation. Um, and we had 250 responders uh, within a day. Um, and they were asked to list topics amongst other things. But we asked them, we asked what was the topic that you wanted to hear more, more about? And at the top of the list is skin reactions to COVID. So it's a very timely topic for us tonight. Uh, the other things that were rated very highly were telehealth updates. And um, there's an ask for resources and community connections for NPs and PAs so we can share these with each other as we all uh, hope to get back to work in the very near future. Um, uh, I know a TJ is going back this week and um, hopefully all of us will be back up to speed in some fashion or another uh, over the next few months. So our goal tonight really is to share useful and practical resources experiences and information that we can all benefit from as we transition into what's going to be the new normal uh, for our world of dermatology and specific for us as NPs and PAs. Uh, we'll post a summary of the resources that we referenced tonight um, on the blog page of the uh, website dermnppa.org. So uh, try and just absorb the information as it's coming across to, so you don't have to worry about writing these things down we'll post them so they're available to you. So we've received quite a few questions from all of you uh, prior to the webinar and we've incorporated them into the procedure. I have to say hi to Christine Cusera. She's got her little dog on her lap. That's the dog that was yapping a couple weeks ago. Very cute. <laughs> um, I see Wendy Cantrell there as well. So it's wonderful to have our advisors on the call as well tonight. Um, so, we tried to incorporate all the questions that we got ahead of time into the discussions. If you have questions as we're going through the program tonight, you can send them, please, using the uh, Zoom chat. There's a Zoom group chat. You can send those directly to our host, Stacy Moore of Physician Resources, and she'll get them to me, uh, and I will uh, read them to our panelists and we can have a nice discussion as we get through the um, presentation. So um, without further ado, it really is my pleasure to welcome uh, physician assistant and my good friend, TJ Chow from Georgia. TJ has served as a trustee and president of the Georgia Dermatology Physician Assistant Group. He currently serves on the GDPA board 
as a past president. And as I alluded to earlier, TJ's practice is opening this week. So we're really anxious to ask him some questions, um, figure out what his expectations are and see what we can learn from TJ's experience. So TJ, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. We're also joined uh, by our friend and esteemed dermatologist, Dr. Brad Glick. Dr. Glick is the program director of dermatology residency at Larkin Community Hospital in Palm Springs, Florida, and the director and the primary investigator of the GSI clinical research. So he brings to us tremendous experience and knowledge. He's also a clinical assistant professor of dermatology at the Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine in Miami, Florida. Dr. Glick is a Derm 2020 returning faculty member as well. So hopefully if all goes well and the company, uh, the country's open for live meetings in Vegas this summer, you'll get to come spend some time with Dr. Glick at Derm 2020, August 6th to August 9th. So we're so pleased to have him here uh, to join us and share some of his own cases and experiences with us as well as key takeaways from the literature reports of COVID-19 skin reactions. So Dr. Glick, thank you again for joining us this evening. We you know, very much look forward to your insights. Please uh, go ahead and take it from here. Well, Joe, thanks so much. And I'm, I'm so happy to be here as I'm always uh, so pleased to be involved with DEF. So we can pull up the slides. Uh, there's uh, about 20 slides that we'll get through. Um, and. Um, you know, I, I wanna make this, you know, a relaxed conversation. Um, about a month or so ago, we started getting some reports that somewhere around five to 11%, uh, Bobby Book out in New York, uh, they basically stated in one report that about five to 11% of the patients with COVID-19 had some dermatologic uh, ramifications. And, and I think we found just in the last couple of weeks, uh, significant reports um, from some cases and some studies that were uh, coming out of Italy and France uh, of some more unique manifestations and, and mostly uh, what are typical viral ramifications uh, of uh, what we see in other viral illnesses, but we're starting to see some unique, more skin signs of systemic disease. So let, let's move on and talk about these dermatologic manifestations. So what we're seeing is it's from the typical to the perplexing, as you see to the left there, urticaria, more biliform type changes, more common findings that we'll see in patients with viral illnesses, but then there's been some more unusual presentations. And, and it really hasn't specifically uh, selected out uh, age groups, perhaps some gender, but we'll get into that in a couple moments. Next slide. So we know the typical features of COVID-19 presentation are more respiratory, fever, cough, sore throat, the typical features. But the longer this perfect name for COVID-19 being a novel virus, more that it's around there, we've seen some unexpected symptoms and presentations. So an ophthalmologist conjunctivitis. In general, we've been hearing more about loss of taste and loss of smell. Some patients have presented with hemoptysis, really profound decrease in appetite, probably because of low, the uh, uh, loss of uh, taste as well. And, and now from a cutaneous standpoint, we've seen these COVID toes. And, and I term this more COVID digits because we're seeing it happen in, on, on the, uh, the hands as well too. And this has been coined by dermatologists and we're gonna see some pictures of this this evening. So urticaria, we all know what this looks like. Typical wheels, we saw this in some cases uh, out of France and Fil Finland and as well Italy. And you can see as the pictures as they come up, typical wheels. You know, I'm getting some phone calls in my practice already. Hey, I've got some hives, do I have COVID-19? And we may be fielding some of these things, but we are seeing these in patients with COVID-19 and certainly see this on a day-to-day -day basis. So we'll have to counsel our patients accordingly. And we'll talk about therapeutic intervention in, in a moment, next slide. Morbilliform eruptions, which I kind of alluded to already, you can see to the right, that's a typical presentation of a morbilliform viral process or maybe a morbilliform drug reaction. Next. But in, in patients with COVID, we'll see these changes. We might even see this classical human parvovirus B19 type presentation as we have seen in COVID patients with the so-called slap cheek appearance of the skin. Next. And then next. 
And in some patients, we'll see these dengue fever-like cutaneous eruptions like we see in patients with dengue. And these patients may have this background erythema with these islands of sparing, no scale like we'd see in pityriasis ruba pilaris. It's less common, but as you see, I'm gonna show you one of my cases that I saw just within this past two weeks. Uh, you'll see some of these islands of sparing uh, in some of these patients. Treatment considerations, remove the offending agents. Uh, high potency corticosteroids will work well with many of these cutaneous eruptions. And when we talk about COVID toes in a couple of moments, uh, that, that's what we tend to treat these patients with unless they progress substantially. Antihistamines, systemic steroids have been controversial in the setting of COVID patients, but I think early on, uh, if these patients are uncomfortable, certainly it may make sense. We may need to check some labs in these patients looking at LFTs and the eosinophil counts and evaluating these patients for DRESS syndrome. Thus far, most of the cutaneous manifestations of COVID-19 have been self-limiting and hopefully it will continue uh, this way as uh, this very fluid situation from a medical perspective uh, continues on. Next slide. Some of the patients will present with a varicella-like uh, presentation. We've seen this in, in, in some younger patients and remember, uh, viruses can, can, can occur together. We've seen a lot of patients uh, with COVID-19 who also have concomitant uh, influenza. And so we, we certainly have to still test these patients for uh, varicella, uh, but we are seeing some uh, presentations like this. And there are a number of these cases in Italy. Next slide. Acroischemia. This is what we see in the so-called COVID digits or COVID toe type presentation. Um, so you see a picture of the toes here, the hands here as well. Next slide. We've also seen some very unusual levito-like patterns in patients with COVID. So there's just one example in the center and then to your uh, left of your screen, um, a very typical pre uh, presentation of levito. It may be unilateral. That seems to be the typical COVID presentation, but we'd see it bilateral in some patients. There have been some reports in the community and many in the ICU, and those have been obviously particularly sick patients. And what's the mechanism of disease? Mechanism of disease, we're not sure, but probably some microthrombotic phenomenon. Next slide. And petechial changes, vasculopathic type changes. Next slide. As we see in these uh, clinical presentations, this is more follicular, perifollicular type presentation of petechiae. And as you see on the left side, petechiae and purpura are coexisting. So let's look at these cases that were just published within this past week. Uh, in the JAD. This is one example of unilateral levito reticularis, a 67-year-old male who was hospitalized for COVID-19. The symptoms began about 10 days prior with a low-grade fever, nasal congestion, post-nasal drip and cough without shortness of breath, some typical uh, changes uh, in symptoms of COVID-19. Seven days into the symptoms, the patient noticed a transient non-paritic blanching unilateral libido-like presentation on the right anterior thigh resembling libido reticularis. And this has been most of these unusual cases being uh, <clears throat> uh, unilateral. Uh, the eruption lasted for about 19 hours. It went away. The patient not evaluated by a dermatologist uh, penultimately for a biopsy. Ironically, these patients have really bizarre symptoms, a gross hematuria, generalized weak weakness, concurrent with the eruption and it resolved within 24 hours. Patient, fortunately for them, were discharged on supplemental oxygen. Next slide, next case. So here's another uh, individual, 47-year-old female with a background history of celiac, Hashimoto thyroiditis, and, and a few years back had a portal vein thrombosis. Negative workup for a hypercoagulable state. This patient presented with some COVID symptoms of headache, sinus pressure, loss of smell, and fever about 10 days after testing positive for COVID-19 with a complete clinical convalescence. So the patient was doing better with resolution of symptoms, went outside to relax in some long pants, had some direct sunlight for about 20 to 30 minutes. Patient moved indoors, noticed a unilateral asymmetrical rash resembling levito reticularis, really bizarre in her right leg. And then, you know, there were equal amounts of sun exposure on both legs and the rash approximately lasted about 20 minutes and then went away. And it appears that there's some unusual phenomenon that when you go from the warm and the heat and into the cool, just like we see with patients' libido, it, it, it tends to occur, but it doesn't appear to be persistent in some patients. Next slide. So what is the hypothesis? Some microthrombotic phenomena, as I said before. We tend to see this more in the critically ill patients. Those patients are more of a symmetrical presentation, but it, 
can vary. And from the authors from the JAD uh, trial and the JAD studies, they postulated that manifestations can vary from transient review of reticularis in mild to moderate cases to acrocyanosis in the critically ill patients. And I think another hallmark of that is the symmetry. Next. So this is my case. I really just put this into this deck. This is a 14-year-old male. You'll see these pictures. This looks like a more biliform presentation. Perhaps on your left, you'll see what I was talking about before, uh, some islands of sparing. This 14-year-old male came into our clinic, had a family member, a parent, uh, was COVID-19 positive. This patient had not been tested. Next slide. And look at the changes on the toe. Look at that distal lateral area in the uh, perionuchial tissues, this kind of dusty erythema. And I circled that for you. This looked to me like COVID toes. And we sent this out, uh, this patient out for testing. I don't have the result. Next slide. So how do we treat these presentations and how do we treat COVID digits, topical corticosteroids? Around the country, and I think in Europe and, and also in China, they've treated these patients with clobetasol and higher potency corticosteroids. Um, my patient, I actually gave simply triamcinolone, keep the feet warm. There may or may not be a role for aspirin. Fortunately, most of these cases have been self-limiting in about 10 to 14 days. Next slide. Just as a general comment and from the JAD article, in the future, as I alluded to before, getting some biopsies, I think, will really help us. And, and as well, because we may see cutaneous manifestations of a systemic viral process like COVID-19. We have to do some lab workups too. So platelet counts, coag studies, et cetera. Next slide. Next slide. So this was a very interesting report and we really just put this together and I thank Stacey Moore for this. Um, so this was a study that's about to be published in the British Journal of Dermatology and it's a cross-sectional study. They surveyed doctors and nurses in Wuhan, China, and some of the surrounding regions, some of the bigger hospitals and the smaller surrounding hospitals, to look at what were the adverse reactions in the skin that the healthcare workers were experiencing. About three quarters of them, of 376 respondents, did demonstrate some of these cutaneous findings, dry skin, severely dry skin, scaly skin, contact dermatitis, redness, maceration. I think a lot of these patients probably had granuloma fissurotum, as we know it in dermatology. Uh, macerated areas on the nasal bridge and the um, helical groove. Uh, most common affected areas, uh, hands, probably contact dermatitis in those settings, cheeks, uh, nasal bridge. About 22% of the patients reported moisturizing their hands after washing. And I think this is a big deal. And moving forward, we're going to have to encourage our healthcare workers, particularly since we're all sanitizing and washing so much that we're going to have to add in barrier restoration. Now, the multivariate analysis in this study did show that there was a significant impact from uh, the use of person, personal protective uh, equipment for extended periods of time, more than six hours a day, which was one of the more common findings. And I think overall, the authors were hoping from this study that there would be further insight really as to how we can help our frontline workers accordingly. And there's just some clinical pictures I put into the deck of what some of these people look like. You may have seen these online. Just from the time that these, pay, these uh, workers are working uh, in the front lines and with these horribly critically ill patients, this particular presentation almost looks like a SLE or rosacea form kind of presentation. So I think we're going to be seeing some very unique presentations, with, particularly with our healthcare workers moving forward. Uh, don't have a picture of contact dermatitis, but that was very commonly reported uh, from this cross-sectional study. Next slide. Test, test, test. We really need to start testing. And as TJ talks in a couple of moments, I think as we move forward and we open up our practices, this is going to be crucial. You know, kind of our American Express card, we won't leave home without it. So hopefully, uh, many of us will have been exposed and have a positive IgG, a negative IgM, and we can kind of move into life and then even in our clinical practice with some comfort. Next slide. I think what's really important is the establishment of a whole host of registries. Next slide. Having the opportunity to report cases of COVID-19 with dermatologic manifestations is crucial. As here with the American Academy of Dermatology, you have a handout, so you can certainly uh, send in your cases accordingly. There's a registry for the International Psoriasis Council. Next. Uh, these are uh, two uh, upcoming, uh, you'll see in the next slide, Secure PSO, it's called uh, Secure AD and Secure AA. So for psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, and alopecia areata, 
we have patients on immunomodulatory therapies, and I think it's really important that we report these cases of COVID-19 in these settings where patients are on these systemic therapies and they have these conditions like psoriasis, like atopic dermatitis uh, and alopecia areata, also inflammatory bowel disease. There's a GI registry as well. Next slide. And around the world, there's a collaboration, a steering committee and collaborative partners from all these associations and organizations. Next slide. There's also a registry for our patients with Hedroadenitis suportiva. So reporting uh, COVID-19 cases in anyone with HS is very important, uh, plus or minus the therapies that are on, because this will be very important information as we move forward and we further engage all of these individuals with these cutaneous manifestations. So with that, I've done a quick run through of cutaneous manifestations of COVID-19. So um, hopefully this has been helpful information. And once again, to the DEF, uh, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. And of course, I'm gonna be around to answer questions and hopefully we'll have some engaging questions accordingly. Yeah, Dr. Glick, thank you. Um, I think that we're all gonna be seeing these presentations as they come, as we re-enter practice and maybe even we'll see them or encounter some, some of them over telehealth. Uh, I think that um, developing some protocols and as we get more information, understanding whether these are early signs um, is going to help us determine what the status of our patients are. But like you alluded to, all roads lead to testing. Uh, there's definitely no way around that. So um, we don't have any, the questions are coming in. We'll get them at the end because they're, I think they're still being typed. So what we'll transition now um, into uh, TJ. Um, I just wanted to, I just noticed my mom has joined this call. So I hope she hasn't fallen asleep while she's watching. Uh, mom, are you up still there? Yeah, she's still there. That's good. Okay. You raised a wonderful son. You raised a wonderful <laughs> son. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure at least we'd have one person on the call. So she was my go-to to make sure we didn't get skunked here. Uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll take some questions at the end from Dr. Glick's presentation. Uh, so we're also just so lucky to have our good friend TJ uh, with us here tonight. Um, he, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, teledermatology and reopening the reopening of our practices. Well, the impact of the pandemic is felt differently depending on what state you're in. Um, social distancing, state regulations, and guidance vary dramatically um, in hot spots versus rural communities. Uh, from city to city and state to state, there's a tremendous amount of difference. So uh, specifically with respect to TJ, um, so TJ comes to us from the state of Georgia and on the georgia.gov website, uh, there are many guidelines regarding the shelter in place executive order that went into effect in that state on April 2nd. So please remember throughout this discussion, we encourage you to seek guidance from your own state and local authorities. So beginning tomorrow, April 24th, some businesses in Georgia will begin to reopen with minimum basic operations. So minimum basic operations include, but they're not limited to screening workers for fever and respiratory illnesses, enhancing workplace sanitation, wearing masks and gloves as appropriate, and practicing social distancing by separating workspaces by six feet, using teleworking if possible, and then implementing staggered shifts. I'm guessing that most of us that are still in clinic are already doing all of these things so that we can provide a safe environment for our patients as well as our staff. So on Monday, April 27th, and subject to social, uh, specific social distancing and sanitation mandates, theaters, private social clubs, and restaurants with dine-in service are gonna be allowed to reopen in Georgia also. So I think all of us are hoping to see this day come in our own environment, in our own societies, in our own cities, and to our own practices in the not so distant future. Uh, but TJ, thank you again for being here and sharing your experiences and your plans for reopening with us. So could, let's start off by TJ, tell us just your experience about what happened? I think we talked the day that that the, that we were uh, ordered to be sheltered in place. Uh, but can you give us, from you know, in your own words, um, how your practice reacted initially to the crisis? Uh, well, initially, uh, you know, in the days when it was developing, 
Um, you know, we all thought it's going to stay in New York. It's going to stay in Seattle. It's going to stay in San Francisco. And that's why I called you and I, and I thought, oh, this is never going to come. This is never going to come to, uh, to Atlanta. And lo and behold, somebody in Atlanta flew in from Italy and basically spread it all over, um, you know, all over Atlanta. And then a hard hit area uh, in Georgia has been in the south, in Albany. Um, if you take Albany off the map of Georgia, uh, our, our rates are actually a lot, a lot lower. We're very low um, in state-wise if you take out Albany. So a little southern city has been hit quite hard. Uh, but, you know, I was in denial. Uh, we were all in denial. We were in shock. We didn't know what to do uh, when the owner of the practice came and said, hey, we need to start cutting back patients. Um, and then, you know, we need to uh, just start minimizing older folks. And, and little by little, um, I'm sure as with all of you, we experienced a significant decrease in, in business. And patients began calling and canceling. And before you know it, uh, the shelter in place came about and, uh, and, and it, is, it is what it is. And we've gone to telehealth. Um, I see maybe about 20 patients a day in telehealth. And that's because I frankly have been the most aggressive in my practice at trying to move patients toward telehealth. I've, I've trained some of the staff um, in what to say and how to, how to promote the, tele, the telemedicine approach. Um, I also have had a lot of patients on Accutane, and that's been really what I feel has saved me are, are my Accutane patients. Without them, um, you know, I might have a handful of patients every day. Um, and also, I have a, you know, a large psoriasis population, so that's, that's been also very reliable for me. But I'm sure as all of you are experiencing, the volume just isn't there on telehealth. It's, it's, not, it's not as great as it could be, um, and I think part of it has to do with patient acceptance. I don't... I, what I saw in the beginning was a lot of patients weren't interested um, in in adapting to telehealth, but as time's gone on, they've almost been forced to, and now the acceptance of it is is growing. Um, and then I also think it's the way you, the way you train your staff and how to talk to the patients and what to say and how to promote it. I think initially our staff was basically just calling the patients and saying, "Well, you can cancel and we can reschedule you for later, or you could do telehealth." And with them saying it that way, it, it wasn't very convincing for the patients or maybe the patients didn't understand what they were getting or what kind of value they were getting from the, the telemedicine. But we, we actually came out with a script of how they should talk to the patients and how they should suggest telehealth. Um, and even when the patients find out that the cost is very close to, to being the same for them for telehealth, they're still willing to do that now. So we've come a long way um, in, in the telehealth approach. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Um, if you ever speak to an attorney, they bill you every 15 minutes for a fraction of their hourly rate. Yeah. And we talk to patients every day, all day, or our staffs do, our staff does answering questions and that's non-reimbursable. So having a, pa the patient had to have a paradigm shift in the idea of having a virtual visit that wasn't free. And so I think they did come around quickly once the um, platforms were up and running and the overall reception of patients has been super positive um, because they're isolated in their homes and you know they get to see a familiar face and they've been very appreciative of it. How do you, so as you reopen TJ, how do you see um, the telehealth portion of your practice um, fitting in? Well, that's interesting because I, you know, I, I've been doing telehealth a little bit with some of my Accutane yes. patients for the last year and a half already. Uh, for some of the patients that were going off to college, we, I've been doing telehealth with, with maybe a handful of patients every week. Um, and I just didn't see it really being something that we could fit in long term. But as time's going on, you know, we're looking at this and why are we going to make patients leave their home for acne when you can clearly see what's going on with their face? on the video. Um, you know, I, I think it's going to play a large role, especially in the next 18 months, because in the next 18 months, uh, frankly, we don't know if we're going to have the ability to see all of our patients in office. We don't know how things might change, how, um, you know, is this disease going to be controlled? Is it not going to be controlled? Is, you know, remdesivir today, they came out with a study showing it doesn't work as well as maybe they thought. 
So we have a lot of promises, hydroxychloroquine, remdesivir. They're not really uh, producing the kind of results that we were hoping for. So this, thing, this situation is very fluid and it could, it could get worse over time. So we, we don't know how it's gonna change. So I think definitely in the next 18 months, telehealth is gonna play a huge role, especially for the minor things like acne, um, maybe skin lesions. Uh, but I think by the time this is over, too much time is gonna have gone by with this being a standard that it's gonna completely revolutionize the way we do things. And I think it is here to stay um, in the long term. How do you feel about that, Dr. Gleck? Yeah, you know, first of all, I have to just compliment TJ. Uh, I think it's really important hearing what you said with your staff, because I'm going to be very transparent. In the beginning, yeah, my front staff was saying, well, you can do this uh, or telehealth. I think the first thing should be is we're here for you. That's Our right. clinicians are all still around, and we actually have a, a conduit. We have a bridge to you that it's actually quite effective. We can take care of most things, possibly keep you out of the office, which you wanna be out of the office now, and certainly out of the emergency room where we wanna keep our patients out of the emergency room. So I really, uh, that was so helpful to me, and, and I'm taking that in, into my office tomorrow with me, because I wanna make sure they're telling them, we're here for you, not you can reschedule, you can have an appointment today, it's just gonna be done a little bit differently. And I agree with Joe, uh, it, the reception thus far, except for those that have difficulty navigating through the vehicles to get there. <laughs> at, at the end of most consultations, people are, have a kind of appreciation, at least with me, that has been spectacular, at least for me. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I always think about when we're, you know, as we come out of this, that I'm going to look at these dates and remember that these were telehealth visits uh, during the COVID era. And um, we, we're getting some questions about the script. And so, um, I think we've covered it pretty well. TJ, if you're willing, and I, I know we have a script also, because we're all learning on the fly here how to capture these patients when they call and uh, convert them to telehealth. Uh, so we'll try and um, provide some of that on our um, evil, on the um, recap tomorrow. But TJ, do you have any, any other specific tips in terms of the script that your front office uses? Well, just, just like Dr. Glick said, um, you, you basically, I don't know the verbatim, and I can provide that information. I'm happy to provide that information as our verbatim script. Uh, script. Uh, but basically, we try to explain to the patient that uh, they can achieve the same um, treatment via telehealth, um, and it's going to be a very comprehensive visit. It's going to be about 15 minutes or longer. We, do, we, do, we tell the patients that that we're not going to just look at something and then rush them off. We're gonna have a conversation just as we would in person. Um, and if they, we have some answers, and I don't know what those answers are off the top of my head, but I can provide this. Um, when they object, when they, if there's any objections that they might have and um, how, to, how to answer those objections. Because patients are gonna to try to make excuses. Um, for example, a patient hasn't been in for a year, they wanna refill on a topical steroid you know, we really can't just give them a refill uh, just because there's COVID, right? I mean, we have to be careful. We still have to be cautious in how we treat these patients. And so we try to explain to the patient that there's dangers um, to topical steroids, and we have to ensure that they're utilizing the product safely. So those types of answers, responding to the patients um, in that manner to try to explain to them why they need telehealth and why we just can't do things the way they want, why I can't just give them a refill, for example. Yeah, that, I think that's really useful. And you know, it brings up another good point about telehealth and uh, making sure that you have the patient's chart, whether it's a paper chart or whether it's uh, electronic medical records in front of you when you're doing these visits. Because the last thing that we need to do, just because we're doing virtual health, um, we're still susceptible to malpractice lawsuits. So you've got to check allergies. Uh, you've got to be very, just like you're in the office, you have to be extremely diligent that you send in the right medication for the right patients. One thing we've done um, is, for example, if a patient is concerned about a lesion, uh, we've, we have them take three photographs of the lesion and a still <laughs> photograph. Um, if any of you've done telehealth and trying to look at a lesion on, you know, because we, frankly, we use Google Duo and FaceTime. I know that's, and hopefully we can keep using that. We have eClinical Works and our platform was not good. It just, it just didn't suit us. 
we could do a lot more with FaceTime and Google Duo. Um, but even with that, the visualization of lesions in an exam during a telehealth visit is very poor. So we have the patient submit three photos of the lesion of concern uh, before we speak to them. And by the time we get on the phone with the patient, we know what we're gonna be talking about. So that was really, really helpful um, in avoiding potential you know, issues with, with that visit. That's great, that's great. Yeah, I think we're all learning uh, some pearls and practical tips of uh, telehealth. And pigmented lesions is one of the things that you know, we have to make a decision as to whether we're gonna bring these patients home or br bring these patients into the office. There are some platforms where you can do a alpha-less um, biopsy where you can actually mail the kit to the patient. Uh, we'll be talking more about that next week. Um, it's really, um, I mean, our, our virtual tool belts are, you know, started filling up. We started with a tool belt for virtual health that wasn't much, but now uh, through our own experiences and sharing with each other, I think we're all becoming much more adept at it. So TJ, what specific um, plans uh, or strategies have you come up with or is your office implemented in terms of bringing in, I'm sure you have a log of patients that want to come in, uh, surgeries, excisions, um, other patients that want to come in. Have you stratified them uh, in any fashion in terms of bringing them back into the office? Well, that, that's a great question. And uh, three days ago when I spoke to you, Joe, and the governor had made that announcement, we were gung-ho. We were just like, we're going to open up and we're ready to go. And then reality set in of hey, we're not ready for this. And there's some things that we've done since then to get us ready, and I'll, I'll explain those further. Um, but basically, what we've done the entire time is uh, we've pulled down the, the, the patients that we've rescheduled, and I pull them off the EMR, and I've been, I've been prioritizing them in, in, in uh, priority groups, essentially. It, we're trying to take a very, very strategic and measured approach to, to how to prioritize these patients. So we, we, we decided that we were gonna put them in, in four groups, essentially. Um, initially though, we are, we are gonna, you know, starting tomorrow, we are doing some excisions. We, we have 85 excisions that we need to do um, as a group. Uh, you know, I don't know, everyone's different. Everyone has, has uh, approached this differently. We basically followed the AED guidelines to a T. We, we haven't even done melanoma in situ just as they suggested that where they were saying we could wait three months on that. We don't want to wait any longer. We want to get them in and take care of it. So first we're going to do a lot of procedures. Um, and the, but we have stratified those procedures. In other words, we're trying to bring in all the young patients first to buy more time for the older patients. So we're going to try to bring, we, we have all, them all listed out um, in order of how we're going to bring them in. Now, obviously, there's issues because we've called some patients, they don't wanna come in, they're scared to come in. So we're gonna to have to keep following these patients over time. Um, and then we're going to go into the groups of, we're gonna bring in anyone from 40 to 50 next, 50 to 60, then 60 to 70, 70 to 80, and then 80 plus over the next three to four weeks and spread it out over time. Um, and then after that is, after that is completed, uh, and in, in, not all of us are going are to be able to do all these excisions, right? I mean, some of us are going to be seeing normal patients in emergencies. Uh, we're only going to go to about 60 to 70 percent of our normal. We're not going to go to 100 percent. That might be in a month or two, but it is, you guys are going to see, and what I'm about to tell you with what the measures we're taking, it is going to be impossible for you guys off the bat to see 100 percent of the normal patient load, but I'll go into that in a minute. So we also stratified um, all the complete skin exams. So I, I, I was booked out for about three months. So we have all these skin exams um, that we have to do. And so we stratified those as well. Um, group one are melanomas. Groups are patients with history of melanoma in the last two years. Group one B is melanomas, uh, you know, greater than two years. Then group two are patients with a history of squamous cell the last two years. Um, and then there's group 2B is patients that have had multiple non-melanoma skin cancers. Uh, group three are basal cell cancers, uh, patients with a history of basal cell cancers in the last five years. Um, and then group four are the patients with a history of atypical nevi, dysplastic nevus, or 
um, actinic keratosis. So we've, we've kind of broken it down that way. And we're, when we add these patients in to do complete exams, we're, we're using those priority groups into where to place them. In those groups as well, we're also stratifying them based on age. Again, bringing in the younger patients first that have had the history of these diseases and kind of delaying over time um, the, older, the older patients. Uh, I, I think, you know, as you all know, the greatest risk uh, for COVID uh, uh, death is with, with patients that are older, definitely over 65 is, is a concern. So we have, to, we have to take that into consideration. We're also looking at uh, comorbidities in some of these patients. If we see that they uh, have a COPD, history of cancer, um, you know, we, are, we have basically tagged those patients and we are gonna be extra careful with those patients. So when they come in, uh, we're gonna treat them very strategically and carefully to make sure that we minimize their risk. Um, and then we're still gonna try to avoid, I think probably like we said before, we're gonna try to avoid bringing patients into the office as much as possible. So, and I really hope that uh, the government officials and uh, insurance companies and Medicare allow us to continue this, this telehealth uh, business at the level we're being reimbursed at and the ability to have freedom in, in how we do that. Because we would like to do this for at least 18 more months as until the vaccine comes. And I, my hope is that it just stays like this permanently, uh, maybe seeing patients periodically in the office for, for Accutane. Um, so that, that's, really, that's really the way we're gonna approach that aspect of it um, in regards to getting patients in. Well, that's great. That was very thorough. And uh, I think we're all gonna learn as we go through this and each practice will do it differently. Uh, while you were talking, uh, Wendy Cantrell, one of our advisory men, um, members, sent in a text, and to your point exactly, she said, uh, our office did a great job really early on explaining telemedicine. Um, she emphasizes that customer service has always been a priority for her and her office, and I think in dermatology, it should be important for all of us. Um, they did such a good job that they're now booking out two weeks uh, with providers having uh, full clinics in tel uh, of telemedicine patients. Um, they're requiring pictures where possible. Um, and then um, even new patients are booking for telemedicine appointments uh, for their practice. So I think that uh, the point that you made of the, um, when the first uh, encounter with, the pa with our patients is our front office staff, making sure that they get the appropriate greet greeting at the highest you know, customer service level possible will help uh, us convert them into telemedicine patients. But really, the world of dermatology for all of us is about seeing patients in the office. It's a 3D specialty. We're a procedure-based specialty. Telemedicine is a great option. Um, we hope that all of the private insurers will pay at the same rate as Medicare. We're not sure, but we hope they will. Um, yet, at some point, that may change. And if that changes, our whole strategy with, ch with telemedicine may change as well. But for now, I mean, we really have to own it and maximize the efficiency and the quality that we can provide to our patients through the different telemedicine platforms that we're using. Dr. Glick? Uh, listen, so well stated, TJ. That was awesome. And what I, I'm so impressed by is the organizational component to it because I, I like the stratification idea. Another thing that I will bring back to my practice as we move forward, I think that's a really, really good idea to prioritize so it's not just reckless abandon as people come back right. and trying to get everyone in because it may get very confusing. And I think that you know, putting reimbursement aside, for me, as I, I predict this for my practice, that this will, this experience will change the face of just how I work on a day-to-day -day basis. It's my 25th year of practice. I do envision from 3 to 4.30 in the afternoons or a little bit later doing the acne follow-ups, the simple psoriasis follow-ups. And a lot of these patients that, as TJ said, don't really necessarily need to come into the office more than once or twice a year, as opposed to they've been coming in every three or four months or even that in that frequency of every six months live. And that'll give us the opportunity to do what we're also so talented as doing as a group is procedures. Uh, and instead of patients waiting for long periods of time, three months booked, TJ, amazing. 
uh, you know, they'll get in there more timely for some of their procedures that they've been waiting for. So it could help us out in that regard as well. Yeah. How about uh, logistics with your practices? Are you uh, concerned about not being able to fill orders for gloves uh, and other office supplies or PPE as, you know, be, you know there's, there's not enough testing, right? All roads lead to testing uh, while we're in this environment where we're seeing patients, assuming everyone's infected uh, because we don't know whether they are or not because we don't have testing. Do you have uh, adequate supply? Or are you able to get access to what you need for you and your staff to um, practice safely? Uh, the getting the N95 uh, masks are a major are a major problem. I'm not sure if everyone else is having that issue. We the uh, head physician in our practice is from is South Korean, and she had a shipment a, a box full of them shipped in from from South Korea. So we have that, but it's not going to last. And the access for us has been extraordinarily, extraordinarily difficult. We also had to remove the gloves out of our exam rooms. Um, I'm not sure if anybody has experienced this, but we've had, we've had people steal gloves um, off the wall, uh, entire box of gloves, um, and put them in their big purse uh, or whatever that they brought in with them. So we've, uh, we've had toilet paper stolen. Um, so it's, 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 it's getting bad out there. I yeah, do I think, oh, go ahead, Dr. No, I'm sorry, Joe. I, I do clinical and academic medicine. And so I have students, residents, and interns in our practice. Now we haven't had it for the next month, but in a, a, a very interesting phenomenon. And for those of you uh, nurse practitioners and PAs as well that do teaching in your practices, uh, the question is when things even get to the somewhat reasonable new normal, how do you spare some of the PPE for those individuals? And so we've made a plan that we're probably not gonna be bringing back more than one resident at a time into the appropriate clinical setting until things normalize and we can get a handle on PPE. Now, just this past week, we've been getting some more deliveries, some gloves, finally got some hand sanitizer. We didn't have hand sanitizer for like two weeks. We were scraping from our homes, trying to bring it in. It was crazy, uh, sanitary wipes and what have you. Uh, so it's been a big challenge, but we're going to limit that component of our practice so that we have enough for our staff that are providing the actual care. Yeah. You know, what we're doing in our practice with hands, with respect, we've experienced the same thing that you're all experiencing. And with our hand sanitizer, when it goes down about 50%, we pour um, the alcohol, just pure alcohol in, 70% isopropyl alcohol into it to make it, you know, last longer. So we've got a couple questions that um, I'm going to read. Um, the first question is, if you're concerned a patient has a COVID-19 related rash, what, if any, labs or protocol specifically do you take if the patient has been seen via telemedicine? Um, yeah, I'll take that and then, and then TJ, uh, please uh, chime in. You know, I mean, I think if it's telemedicine, uh, first and foremost, uh, I, I want to see that patient face to face as well, and I would certainly engage their their general physician. Uh, obviously, the constellation of symptoms and the appropriate questions need to be asked as to the degree of background illness that they may have. But if they're generally stable, I think that patient needs to be seen. They need to be seen by their general physician. Uh, routine workups, CBC chemistries. Um, Certainly these rashes could be something uh, that is COVID. They may not be COVID, as I mentioned before in the presentation, and we have to be able to size that up. And we're gonna be fielding phone, a lot of phone calls about this, and I'll share with you. Um, one of my patients, been a patient of mine for a long time, had a pretty bad rash in her hands. Uh, I did a telehealth visitation, looked to me like, um, you know, a hand dermatitis, uh, a lot going on in her knuckles. There were some circular lesions. And about 48 hours later, which was about two days ago when a lot of the news outlets started putting out the cutaneous manifestations of COVID because it's all over the place. She actually sent me a text. She has my cell. I know her very well. And she says, oh my God, do I have COVID? So it's going to be challenging handling this. But I think that if we have a patient with suspected COVID rash, we have to size that up. Me personally, I, I'm, I'm still working. I'm seeing emergencies. I mean, I, I tell them contact your general physician, particularly if you have even subtle uh, uh, findings, don't go to the emergency room, don't run to an urgent care center, contact your family physician. And me personally, I see these patients, I will see these patients. Another clinician in my practice, just one last thing is, she is actually seeing frontline workers 
if they develop any kind of rash, you're seeing them for free in one of our clinics. Phenomenal. Yeah, and you know we want to. We would recommend obviously that they do. You know, go get tested. Um, so I'm going to read a few comments. We got some really interesting comments coming in uh, over the line. If we have um, we have one, we have a few more questions as well. But these comments are really insightful. So uh, this one says, "I work at Kaiser Northern California, and we do not have." a confirmed date for in-clinic care. However, our clinic is committed to 50% video visit and 50% in-clinic care. We've discussed that after patients check in at the front desk, if they return back to their car to wait for a phone call to return in. Uh, we're still stratifying which patients to return uh, for in-clinic visits and we plan continuously, our plans continuously change based on the circumstances. Um, this is a comment from uh, Dr. George Kehoe in Tennessee. He says, telemedicine will also be important upon the reopening of the states as social distancing will likely still be required in waiting rooms. We have a waiting room that can seat about 300 people, but we've cut it back to 100 to accommodate social distancing. Tennessee is getting ready to open, and with 10 providers, we're going <clears throat> to have to heavily stagger schedules to, and have patients wait in cars. And we've done that in our waiting room. We've removed almost all the chairs uh, so that if patients are in the waiting room, um, they can be appropriately um, distanced. Um, and then, um, let's see. Joe, I can, I can tell you what we, have, what we have planned for starting tomorrow. Yeah, please. Uh, we, we, so I, I wrote down several things of what we have planned. And this week we had plexiglass, clear plexiglass barriers installed because our, our office, the, the check-in and check-out areas were very open. We've installed plexiglass barriers um, at check-in and check-out with a little area below so that patients can pass paperwork or what have you uh, below. So we had that installed. We had plexiglass barriers um, that are going to be installed in our waiting room chairs. If you've seen uh, what the airlines are planning, they're actually planning to put plexiglass um, basically barriers in between the seats and the airplane. So we've, we're actually going to be installing those in the chairs in our waiting room. We're spreading them out six feet apart. Um, we, at check-in and check-out, we have tape on the floor marking six feet um, we have an official protocol document that's, that's going to be ready, readily available for patients, lawyers, and officials if they come in. One of the things that's happening in Georgia is they're going to be doing contact tracing. Guess what happens if one of our patients has a friend that they, that they went over their house and they have COVID? Guess what happens? They come in and they shut, they're going to shut your clinic down. They're going to shut your, the officials are going to come in just, and they're going to be doing this in businesses they're gonna come in and shut the business down for two weeks. It happened already in, not by officials, but about from the office themselves in the group below us, uh, below us on the second floor. Um, they, they shut down for two weeks after they had an exposure in the office. So that's, that's an issue that you all need to think about um, when, when you guys are gonna be re reopening. All of our patients, we're gonna provide a surgical mask for all of our patients. Um, every staff member has, is gonna have an M95 mask. Uh, they, they're actually going to have five of them, and we're going to have them rotate those. We're going to keep them in baggies Monday through Friday, um, and they're going to use the, you know, they're going to change the mask, um, you know, every every day based on the day of the week because studies have shown that the virus can live on the mask for for several days. Um, everyone's going to be wearing either hair nets or surgical caps. There's going to be gowns for procedures. I haven't worn scrubs in 15 years. And I've gotten, I'm getting rid of my lab coat. I'm, I'm going to scrubs only because there's data to show that the lab coats could spread um, uh, the COVID virus. Um, we're having the patient sign a consent form to treat that they're aware of, uh, that, they're, that they uh, could have an exposure of COVID-19 in our practice. Um, so the, these are just some of the things that we've come up with in the last few days that some of the other businesses in Georgia are doing to have this opening. So, um, you know, we're definitely as a medical office, we're being a lot more conservative as well. Yeah, no, that's great, TJ. We're doing uh, 
essentially the same thing. Uh, our office staff and the providers um, come in to the office uh, with um, their street clothes. And then when they get in, they have to change into the scrubs uh, once we're here. Um, temperature checks need to be done before patients can come in. Right. Hands have to be sanitized and then social. Sanitizing distancing. the rooms. Sanitizing the room. And yep. the chairs outside. Yeah. So um, there's some CDC guidance on some of that. Maybe we'll post some of these um, on, the, um, on the blog as well. So uh, we're running up against the end of the hour here. I want to uh, thank uh, TJ and Dr. Glick uh, for being here and sharing your experiences with us. Uh, we will continue to host the weekly video series. So we hope that you'll send us suggestions of topics that you would like to hear more about, and we will include those in our weekly series. Uh, in the meantime, you can email us at info at uh, Our survey is still open, so if you want to fill out the MPPA Dermatology Survey, um, if it's not in your inbox, send us an email and we'll get you a copy of it. Continue to check out the website, dermnppa.org, on the blog section. Uh, we're posting a lot of updates. We'll send out an e-blast tomorrow uh, with the resources that were discussed tonight, uh, as well as on some of the social media channels. So um, again, thank you all for being here. Thank you for sharing your experiences uh, with us. If you have other comments or suggestions, you know, please reach out to us. Uh, it's easy to get a hold of us, and we'll incorporate them into the uh, next week's uh, video uh, webinar. So with that, uh, I'd like to say good night and a special thank you again to Dr. Glick and TJ for their wonderful contributions.